So anyhow, good evening. Glad to be over here. Um, so I'm kind of just curious, have any of you dabbled in hydroponics at all? All right, we got one. All right. Um, my name is Barbara Liedel. I've been at West Virginia State since 2001. Um, before I went to West Virginia State, I had never done hydroponics in my life. I'd heard about it, I'd seen it, but I'd never done it. And the reason I had never done it is it just never came up. But when I landed at West Virginia State, we had a very large research project and they needed help on the plant side. And I inherited in less than nine months um, a large part of a research project where we um, <clears throat> did anaerobic digestion of uh, poultry litter. And my job was to take what came out of the digester <clears throat> and try and grow things hydroponically in it as well as use it in the field. So I had a really steep learning curve in there and uh, so you're going to hear about my trials and tribulations. I still to this day grow hydroponically. Um, I don't use all the systems that I've used in the past in there but um, we still put one in this year. My tomato breeding program is in hydroponics so you'll hear a little bit about that. Um, if you do have questions, please write them down. Anything's fair game. Um, I will start off with saying there is a resource list. Please help yourself to it. But here's the bottom line. There is no one place to go to get your information on hydroponics. There is not one, one book that you can buy, not the Bible, you know. If you're in soil, there's a soil book. If, you know, mineral nutrition, there's one of those that you can have. Hydroponics doesn't work that way. There also is not like one system. Pretty much everybody, unless you go and buy it from a company, makes their own in there. My system is all made myself. And um, part of the reason is that is we have no companies in our state. Zero. Nada. We don't even have a greenhouse company in our state. So everything has to be shipped in. So um, I'm really good now at what I think one of our people referred to as scrounging and uh, making sure that I've got parts. So um, I have worked with bot systems, but I also now work with my own system. And you'll find more people do their own in there based on what they have access to and what they feel comfortable with fixing. So. This is kind of a filler slide. You may want to dim the lights down so you can see them better. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, this is actually in my greenhouse on this side. This is a vertical hydroponics we will hear about. We're growing uh, um, edible flowers in this. We get 32 plants in 12 square feet in there. So think, don't think just horizontally, think vertically. The other side is actually a commercial tomato greenhouse operation and the two kind of tracks on the bottom line, that's actually there. They have little kind of cherry picker setups that scissor up and down for people to work up the lines. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to first talk about hydroponics, what it is, components of hydroponic systems kind of in general. Then we're going to talk a little bit about organic production, what it is, what does it mean to be certified in there, and then we're going to combine the two together and talk about the future of organic hydroponics. So hydroponics really is a combination of two things. It's the water, the hydro, and the ponics working. So it's water working for you in there. <clears throat> and the key piece in all of this is going to be there's some component in there with water, and in this case, ours is nutrients are also in the water. And it's growing plants in a water and nutrient solution without soil in there. If you start adding soil into it, you're not in a hydroponic system. Um, so vertical, notice strawberries grown in a vertical system. An NFT, a nutrient film technique you'll see later, and that's from many years ago, my greenhouse with tomatoes. What are the benefits of growing hydroponically? You can grow much more efficiently in there. You can make a much more intensive planting, especially when you're going something like vertically. You can utilize all your space in there. 
You can, if you put this in a greenhouse, do it as a year-round production. I do know people who grow this in high tunnels. Uh, there are some places that will even grow it outside. It gets to be a little dicier outside if you leave anything open that stuff can get into the tanks with your nutrients. So it's going to be covering. And also you get away from any kind of soil borne problems in there. So some major pluses. There's also less labor and time required because you don't have weeds, no tilling in there. And actually, because you're really monitoring your water, you're using less water. You're not wasting it, throwing it elsewhere on the soil in there. Though probably if you really compared it to drip irrigation, we'd probably be kind of close on there. Now, those are all the benefits. Now I'm going to give you the negatives because we must see both sides in there. No matter how you slice it, hydroponics does require some specialized knowledge in there and equipment in there. You're going to become very familiar with plumbing and pumps. I had never worked with PVC pipe in my life. And within the first year, <clears throat> the guys on our crew that worked on the digester had introduced me to all the basic terms. I knew the difference between Schedule 80 and Schedule 40. I knew how to cut my pipes in there. So, and I was off and running. So <clears throat> that's a big part of doing it. The other part is going to be nutrient management. Because there's nothing else to buffer your nutrients, no soil there, you're going to have a much limited setup on terms of being able to take care of that plant in there if your nutrients are out of whack in there. So it's going to be a lot more management is required. Higher maintenance than soil based. You got to maintain the pumps, you got to maintain the plumbing, you got to maintain the nutrients and you're going to learn how you do that in there. It also generally requires electricity. And see number one, specialized knowledge <laughs> in there. Higher cost, because you require plumbing and electricity, there's going to be some higher initial costs in there. And again, goes back to the whole specialized knowledge, et cetera. We had run the original greenhouse we were in, we had run systems for three years before we built the greenhouse I'm in currently and had run two different systems and really got a feeling for what we liked and didn't like. And when we designed my greenhouse, incorporated that into my greenhouse. We have not modified anything in that house. But it took that three years of trialing to really figure out what worked and didn't work in our hands. And it would be possibly very different for any of you. But we set up what we liked. Now my greenhouse manager has, <laughs> has an idea to do some other things to my house now after an additional decade of working with it. The other thing you have to be concerned with, because you've got a higher intensity of production, you've got to be really careful about watching for pest problems. So doing scouting is going to be really key, because if you see a problem, you're going to have to jump on it. You can't let it go, because if they're sharing all the nutrient source, like you're running through one of our NFT systems in there, what gets off of one lettuce plant will get off of everyone in the row and everyone that's sharing that liquid if it's coming through the nutrient source. And you'll see that in a minute. So you have to be careful in there. So basics in terms of any kind of, nutri of hydroponic system. There are variants, and I'll show you four of the main ones, but there's a lot of others. But the thing you're looking at is you need to have some kind of shelter and support. Even down in Florida where they do some hydroponics outside, generally they still have some kind of, um, they have to have some support to keep it up. They do, I've seen the vertical systems down there a lot. And usually they kind of have some shelter over it in there, at least a high tunnel or some kind of shade house 
you want to optimize your environment because you're trying to get the best growth out of all of it. So you want to be able to control your temperature to some degree or at least modify it. So rolling up the sides on a high tunnel, turning on fan pad cooling system in a greenhouse. In some cases, if you're trying to grow through the winter, you're going to need to have additional light in there just so that they'll grow in there because your light levels are going to be too low. You got to make sure that you've got a decent quality of water in there. That's probably key. Um, I'm lucky, I'm on city water. But just because it's city water doesn't mean we don't get it tested every couple of years, just in case, plus we could call up and get the city regulations. When I was in grad school, we were having a hard time. We were ha seeing nutrient problems through all, I was at the University of Minnesota, all the range of our greenhouses. Turns out the pH of the water was off in there coming into our greenhouses. And when that went off, it affected fertilizer uptake for all the crops in there. So having a good source of water is important. Air, yes, you want to have air, but you want to have some of that air move around. You want it stagnant, like being outside today where it's nice and humid. Nutrients are going to be key, and we'll talk a lot about that. And you want to be able to test your solution with your nutrients for the pH and the EC, and we'll talk more about what that actually is. And I brought some examples. Um, so you can see in the picture here, this is uh, one from the land. So here's the nutrient reservoir with a little pump, and they've got the tubes coming up, a PVC pipe that comes in with drippers that come off, and then in these gutters, they drain back down into this, so it's a recirculating system, and you recirculate your nutrient solution in there. <clears throat> and we've got a support system to kind of hold the little plants. It looks to be kind of like a tomato. <clears throat> It's wrong leaf for a tomato, but <clears throat> all right. So let me talk about the four primary systems that you might see out there. All right, this is what we consider a water culture, and this is probably the easiest one, and you can even make this at home in there. <clears throat> you can have basically some kind of floating or cover that holds these little kind of um, they're called net pots. And you hold, have the net pots in. Sorry, Richard. The little net pots, and you can come up and see them later. Basically, you can take them in the styrofoam or whatever you have as a cover, a Rubbermaid, Tupperware kind of container, and glue them in and have the plant in here. You got to think about having something like this because if you just tried to put the plant in here with nothing to hold it up, where do you think it would go? Right down. So little net pots, glue them into the styrofoam, self-contained hydroponic solution or hydroponic setup right in there. Um, they talk about having an air stone, basically kind of a bubbler from like an aquarium in there. It's not critical, don't have to have it. Plants do better, they actually do, you do need to oxygenate the nutrient solution below. It helps, but it's not critical. In the recirculating systems, if you have a drop between where your water comes in and where, or where it's coming down, and where it goes into the reservoir, that's enough to keep it oxygenated. You don't have to do a lot in there. But I have a grower that's used that system for years in there. All right, so that's kind of a basic setup. So nutrient solution down below, plants in a structure, may or may not have an air pump. So this is the simplest, <laughs> easiest. You'll see in your resource list, there's also some examples from Kratke in the University of Hawaii on how to set up similar systems. And I think Dr. Desgupta has some examples that if you're interested, ask them about in there. It's really passive. There are no moving parts, which means less input you have to deal with. Now, 
Some of these systems require some kind of substrate or media in there. It's basically what you're going to grow the plants in. Now, there's all kinds of different things you can grow them in. One that's used quite a bit, or has been, and I hate it, and that's rock wool. I don't have any examples of it because I got rid of all of it. Um, rock wool is an expanded um, basalt rock product in there, and as far as I'm concerned, when I had to work with it, if I didn't have long sleeves on and gloves, it was like getting fiberglass on me in there. It was just miserable. Not only that, it's not a recyclable product, it's not a renewable product, so I was not <laughs> real enhanced with it, but you will see lots of operations that use it. It comes in all kinds of ways in there. Other things you can use for putting in pots or starting pots, <laughs> I've brought some different examples. So, one of the best one that's known out there, you've probably seen before, perlite in there. If you haven't seen it by itself, pardon me, I'm going to toss it to you, okay. Um, perlite is actually used a lot in soilless media. It's in there to give aeration. It has no inert factors. All it does is add porosity, and because it's odd-shaped, it allows places for water to kind of hang out when you have it all together in there. I don't have any vermiculite, but that's another product you'll see a lot in the um, media. It's a mica product, and it's expanded in there. See less of it in hydroponics. Core is the other big one. This is actually coconut fiber. Um, so literally when they get the coconut for you to eat, the husks on the outside are taken and actually the, taken out and shredded and used in there. So you'll either see it as coconut fiber or core in there. Coconut fiber um, is, we've been using it since I took the program over. Um, we, we have tried using it straight because some places do in there. I don't like it as much straight. I usually mix it with perlite in there. But what's nice about the core is it's a renewable product. I'm not damaging the environment any more than I have to. It also hangs on to some of the nutrients in there. So some of the things that if you add soil in your pots, the core will actually hang on to some of those nutrients. And so if you end up just pumping water through your system, you're out of nutrients, there's at least a little bit there and you got a little buffer with it. So the mix, and it's starting to get kind of small, but the mix we use is a 85% um, perlite to 15% core, and that's volume to volume in there. Um, we have liked that really well. We've used that in my tomato system for forever. Um, some places use gravel. Trying to find a place to get good gravel and to get it a good size has been a little tough. Some places use sand. Again, trying to find a good place to get clean sand that doesn't have anything else in it and to get enough of it and plus Hauling around and messing with it um, isn't fun. Some people, there's also some things like lava rocks that you can buy. Um, the only problem with things like gravel, lava rocks um, in there, and sand is trying to clean it if you're going to try and use it more than one cycle. Um, you need to know that it's really clean. You don't want to carry over anything from one set of crops to the next one. And I've never found a good system on cleaning. So we've stuck with the perlite and core in there, and we get rid of it every year. In fact, we've used it to actually supplement our soil and to add some porosity and drainage to our soil beds in there. So it hasn't been for naught in there. We don't just go, huh? Mm -mm. Well, it'll, it'll crush down over time, but it doesn't really degrade. In there, it's another one of the rock products. Now, we did a few years ago try something different. 
I had a buddy in Arkansas who said, Perlite, I've heard this great thing you could use to replace it. It's called rice hulls, parboiled rice hulls <clears throat> in there. So I got a hold of Riceland, and they sent us um, several large bags of parboiled rice hulls. You can buy them commercially through greenhouse operations. So through BFG, et cetera, you can buy these. Now, um, we did trials with them in our vertical system, comparing it directly to replacing the perlite. The problem we ran into is because the parboiled rice hulls are kind of shaped like canoes, either they held the water in or they held the water out in there. And what we found in our towers is we had half the amount of water retaining in our tower compared to a tower that had perlite on it. So while it sounded wonderful, it didn't work really great. I do think it's worthwhile looking at again. I would actually grind these up, at least get them down to a particle size and not have them canoe shaped in there and try that out. I think it would be interesting, um, especially since it's a renewable product and it's biodegradable. It will not last more than a season. We had them already composting within our um, pots when we took it out, but it was really nice to work with, really clean, a lot less dust than the perlite, so it was really interested. We also had another friend <coughs> who said, I got an idea of what you could replace corn with. And it's an American product. And I'm big, I'm finding things that are American, and oops, biodegradable, sorry. So <clears throat> we also did some examples, some trials with CANAF. Anybody heard of CANAF before? <laughs> Woohoo! You're more than anybody else. <laughs> um, CANAF is in, kind of like a hibiscus, and it's got basalt fibers in the stems, and that's what's harvested out. The company I got the, the uh, stuff we use from is called Magna Moist, and they make um, liners for baskets instead of core liners. And the reason we were interested is this will actually hold on to water. So it'll hold on to water till it's totally engulfed with water, and then it will release it. Unlike core, which if it's been dried, it takes a lot to rewet it. It is actually, my staff refers to it as more like hair. We tried to get it and cut it up. That was abysmal. We finally ended up putting it through a wood chipper to try and get it into something we might be able to use. But we could never adequately get it mixed in with either perlite or with the parboiled rice hulls. It just didn't mix well. It's like horsehair. Yes. Like like yeah, ex candy. exactly. So it would have been, it would have been great fun if it had worked out as we had planned. I think it just would take a little. I think what I really probably would need is somebody with some more substrate background than I have and some engineering knowledge on there. So that's, I still think it's worthwhile looking at. So I do think there are some other things that could be added to the list depending on what you have available to you. Don't feel put off by trying something different. All right, nutrient management is the big key in any kind of hydroponics. Big key to the success is to first of all remember not all fertilizers are the same. Just because it says it's a fertilizer does not mean it's hydroponic, and hydroponic fertilizers are not the equivalent of soil fertilizers. They have to be water soluble, because what are we working in? Water. They, you ultimately have to re supply all the nutrients because you have no soil there that's holding it to give it anything. So let me give you an example. I hired a greenhouse manager many years ago told her we're getting low on calcium nitrate. We need to get some, you know, get a hold. This is a contact I used before to order it and it needs to be shipped in. She looked at me like I was nuts. She's like, no, we can get it down to local feed and seed. I said, okay, it's on you. She got it down to local feed and seed. 
didn't look to say that it said hydroponic or water soluble. So instead, she mixed it into my tank system and I use injectors on my system. Let's just say she killed my injector for that tank. Thank God it was only the second tank and not the first and the second because that would have been a very expensive mistake. What she had was what you use as calcium nitrate out in the field and it had like a plastic kind of coating or a resin coating around it. And that, when it hit the water, got gummy and got taken up and gum gummed up my entire injector. So just because it's got a fertilizer and it's the fertilizer you're looking for, make sure it says water soluble. Really key. Don't do what we did. Also remember that what you're going to use for nutrients is going to be crop dependent because you're supplying for that crop in there. What I, what I do for strawberries is not what I do for lettuce or for tomatoes in there with it. I may start out the same in some of it, but usually I end up the different on them in there. Most of the greens are going to be really similar. And we'll give you, there's some examples on your resource guide to help you. Um, most people use pre-blended and in most of our nutrient systems that we supply, you supply, either you mix for the tank you're in, like one of those Rubbermaid tanks, or if you're big like me, I have 256 tomato plants in mine, we actually mix a two tank system because our stocks are too concentrated and if I put the calcium nitrate in with the rest of it, somebody would uh, precipitate out. So <clears throat> we have a two tank system, we got it down in there. Now, how many remember pH? Our friend pH, whether it's soil or water. All right, we've got a few people. What you're looking at when you're measuring pH is you're looking at the hydrogen ion content in a solution. So if you're looking at it in the soil, you're taking some kind of aliquot out of the soil, like a pour through method to get liquid and you're measuring that. You're on a scale of one to 14. Put it in perspective, neutral seven, and that's kind of where water should be, though it'll vary. It's not exactly seven. <clears throat> Acidic is under seven, and my favorite example, orange juice, is around three in there. Basic or alkaline is greater than seven. Drano, 14. <laughs> so <clears throat> we're looking in most hydroponic situations to be kind of in the sixes, just under seven. If you start getting above seven, you'll start running into problems in there. The reason why, nutrient uptake is pH dependent. Each nutrient in there, so nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, if you're running, and this is running from four or five up here, if you're running on this high end, yeah, you'll get all your nitrogen, your fo potassium, phosphorus. Calcium's pretty good, even magnesium. What happened to iron? We're losing it once our pH gets higher. Same thing with manganese and with boron. And it can be at one end or the other. So it's really key. And my system, we're running about between probably about 6.2 to 6.8 in there. If we get too much out of whack, we start seeing mineral new deficiencies or toxicities in there. And that's a problem. It should be a tip off in there <clears throat> and you want to fix it right away. Lots of ways to test pH. One of the easy ones is to get little test strips, and I forgot to bring mine, where you literally put the strip in and then compare it with what's on the little container. <clears throat> the one thing to not use, do not go to one of the big box stores and buy a soil testing kit. You can't compare this with testing soil pH. It's not the same thing, so don't get that. It won't work. Or you'll get something, it won't mean anything. We'll try that out. Another option is to use, they sell kind of these inexpensive pens 
that you can calibrate and then put into a solution. Or if you get really upscale, you can actually have a meter. And so I brought one of ours. You can actually be upscale and mount it and have your electrode to go into your solution in there and it'll monitor it on there. You have the ability to adjust. You can set the standard pH 4, pH 7 in there. And this company, you can even buy them in little, you know, once used kits. So you can get your stuff to test it in with and run it on there. And I would strongly urge if you're going to go into this, get something. Even if what you do is start off with this, that's fine. But have something to test your pH to know that you're on <coughs> with it. If your pH is out of alignment, you need to adjust it. You either, you want to add small amounts of whatever is appropriate. If it's too high, i.e. it's over seven, you want to lower it, you need to add something called, a lot of places will call it pH down. <clears throat> so you're adding vinegar or acid in there to get it down. If it's too low, you want to add a base to raise it or add pH up in there. Now here is the kick. Do not add a lot of it. Be very careful because you can overstep it really quick. I'm sure the aquaculture people, you have the same problem? Yes. <clears throat> I will tell you, when we worked with poultry litter <clears throat> and used the effluent that came out, the uh, pH was really high, really high, over eight. And the only way we could get it down, we had to use um, phosphoric acid. Sulfuric didn't do much, plus it added too much sulfur. And we couldn't add nitric acid, <clears throat> didn't really want to either. But um, we didn't want to add the nitric because that was going to change our nitrogen levels and so wouldn't make it comparable on there. So it is something with organic systems, I'll come back to, that you're going to have to be aware of that the pH could be very out of whack or could get very out of whack as the plants grow. And that's going to be a key for anything that's like in a one of those floating raft kind of deals. As they take up the nutrients, it's going to change the hydrogen ion concentration. You're going to have to test and see where you're at. We generally tested our solutions daily, and we remixed weekly. Or if there was a big problem, we remixed right then. The other thing you should really be looking at is electrical conductivity. This is basically a measure of the strength of the nutrient solution in there. It's more how much dissolved salt is actually in this. Now on this little combo meter from Hannah, they actually have a little EC meter um, that's in there. So you can do both pH and EC with one thing. Or you can have what's our favorite and tried and true. This is a Myron meter and uh, the company is Myron. And you basically pour your solution in, compress a button, and there's two electrodes, one at the bottom, one at the top, and it'll measure how much conductivity in there. This has been my favorite and standout. We've had this for, wow, 2001, 2002. So, and they have all the directions on the bottom, and it has a neat little case. So, <coughs> we use that in there. If you have low EC readings, compared to what they suggest for whatever nutrient solutions in there, usually you'll get slower growth rates and see deficiencies. That's a key that you need to remix, which is another reason why we measured that usually daily. Now, the big thing here was to start talking about organics. And let me just start by saying I have grown organically. 
I've been on a project with a number of other schools where we've done organic production, soil-based, not hydroponic, in there. So <clears throat> I've been there. Remember that if you're going to, you want to grow organic anything, hydroponics or not, you've got to grow everything according to the USDA National Organic Program or NOP standards. That's key. And NOP has very defined standards of what you have to do to grow. <clears throat> In the state of Kentucky, I went and checked. You have to apply to be certified if your annual gross organic sale income is greater than $5,000 in there. You have, you have to apply to be certified and it's with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. If it is less than $5,000, you actually don't have to be certified, but you have to apply, you have to have a registration with them and it's free if you're less than 5,000, but you still have to register you cannot say that you're certified organic, but you can list that you have organic crops. Mm -hmm. Yes? What does it cost for that? If you apply, they said for each scope it was $250. So the crop one would be $250. If you did any handling, it would be an additional $250. If you did anything else that went along, it was an additional. Um, so it's kind of dependent on your scopes that you're going after. If you want on the resource list is the University of Kentucky um, website to go that talks all about how to deal with that in there, which just let me say, you guys are very lucky. In West Virginia, we do not have a certifying agency at all. Our options are to either go to Pennsylvania, which is extremely expensive, or to go to Ohio and go to OFA, which is less expensive, but still expensive in there. We have nobody in the state that can certify us or wants to. The other thing you have to do to actually become certified is to develop an organic system plan. This is going to be what procedures you're actually going to go through to actually comply with the standards. So exactly how you're going to grow. How are you going to grow it? What are you going to use? How are you going to manage it? If any part of your farm operation is not going to be organic and you're going to share equipment, how are you going to clean it between the two locations? Basically everything. It's actually not a bad process to go through whatever kind of farm you are, so you kind of create your own standards, your standard operating procedures in there. And I'll put a plug in. I'm not sure where you guys are, but <clears throat> I'm working with several people in our state on um, uh, good handling practices, good agricultural practices, and getting ready for the uh, FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, thanks to FDA, um, things that are going to come into place in October. So um, because we're going to have to have those standard operating procedures. So this is not a bad thing to be doing regardless. So that's what you have to do for any kind of organic production. And how NOP defines organic right now is organic is a labeling term that indicates that the food or other agricultural product has been produced through approved, so going through the certifying agency, methods that integrate cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. So once you have your application in and your your standard your practices that you're going to use they're going to have somebody come out and check you out and they're going to run through the farm and they can look anywhere they can look in your fertilizer shed in there if you have pesticides that aren't for organic use or fertilizers you're going to have to explain to them what they're doing there and are you using them or not and if so, make sure they're not close to your organic stuff in there. The word I was told years ago is most people didn't pass the first time when they got, went through and got certified in there. I have somebody that I, I work with who was, but she's also a trained geologist and worked as a tech in a geology lab, so she's very used to practices, and she studied up on it, and she passed the first time out of the gate. <laughs> but I think she's the exception. Now, that's the current 
listing of what USDA has at the National Organic Program. In getting ready for this talk, <clears throat> I went and did some looking. And I found a little problem. So, the National Organic Program at the USDA is the people who set out what the procedure is and do are kind of like the policing. But they're not the ones who make any new recommendations. That's the National Organic Standards Board, or NOSB. In 1995, when all of this started kind of happening, NOSB didn't consider anybody ever growing anything hydroponic organically. So they didn't even think about it when they started the original plants. In 2002 is when NOP redefined organic production. And that site, that that description of what organic production is was done then. In 2010, actually prior to this, in 2008, the NOSB got very concerned. They feel very strongly, and there's several sites on there so you can read their point. They feel very strongly that you cannot have organic production without soil. And so from 2008 to 2010, they decided, made some decisions, and asked for public comment, and then in 2010 made a recommendation to NOP that organic hydroponics not be allowed. Not organic aquaponics. Aquaponics was fine because it was a recycling of nutrients in there. So they were okay with that one. But just doing hydroponics, they weren't crazy about. Last year, one of the first organically certified farmers in Vermont um, petitioned the National Organic Program to accept NOSB's recommendation. Because NOSB's job is to make recommendation, get public comment, and make the recommendation to NOP. And NOP has sat on it now for five years. And they've done nothing. So this petition really revved everything up. And <clears throat> the other problem is, is that some certifying agencies accept hydroponics in organic systems, others do not. Vermont doesn't, um, doesn't accept it, and Moses out in the Midwest does in there. Pennsylvania doesn't accept it. So it varies state to state, and certifying agencies are different on where they stand. So NOSB is asking the USDA to make a decision so that the certifiers are consistent across the board. The other reason that they're very adamant on this is we are one of the only nations that ha allows organic hydroponics. Canada doesn't, Mexico doesn't, and most of Europe doesn't. So if you are going into the store and seeing organic hydroponic tomatoes from Canada, they're not growing it to sell to their people, they're growing it to sell to us. Might want to think about that. <laughs> Just saying, not saying it's necessarily good or bad, but hmm. So <clears throat> as of this year, um, the Cornucopia Institute and Elliot Coleman um, have really pushed forward with a um, plan trying to get people to agree that um, to quote keep the soil inorganic and they've got a petition out online <clears throat> I'm not saying it's good or bad it just is there and they're pushing USDA NOP to make a decision what NOP has come back with saying is that they are going to establish a task force and that has infuriated the National Organic Standards Board in there because they're like our job is to make the recommendations we got personal comments why aren't you just taking it so I'm just to be fair I'll be honest and tell you this <clears throat> if you're interested in going after it to get the organic extra dollars in there you can go for it I just don't know how long it'll be I don't know how long NOP will be able to 
not do anything. And I think the National Organic Standards Board is pretty adamant they want it out. I don't know how that's going to all play out on the stage, but you need to be aware of it and be watching for it if you want to go that direction on there. So your other option, in my opinion, is to tell people it's locally grown, it's stable, you're using renewable resources or you're recycling, all of those other good things as well if you end up losing it. Right. Your nutrients, they have to be made of what's considered OMRI approved materials. What's OMRI? I listed them on your resource list. It's the Organic Materials Resource Institute. Anything that's approved for use in an organic system, hydroponic or not, has to be OMRI approved. If it doesn't have OMRI approval on it, you can't use it in there. So, it ha so the nutrients have to be OMRI approved. Remember, they have to be water soluble. We already remember that. And remember, it needs to go through an irrigation system, maybe the emitters. So those lovely fish emulsions, which by the way, anybody play with fish emulsions? How do you like the smell? <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's okay. He's not so, yeah, it's, yeah. I used to fertilize a greenhouse on our building that the ventilation is put in with our whole science building in there. I had to do it on Friday afternoons because otherwise the chemists who are on the same floor just came out you know, raving in there. That's pre-U. <laughs> so all of that has to be OMRI approved. Now here's the other one. Don't forget, any of your pH adjusting things also have to be OMRI approved and I haven't found one yet. So you better be hoping that your pH stays in the right range in there. Your media that you're going to use, your substrate, has to be OMRI approved, and I'll give you a list of some and give you some hints. Pest management, basically use whatever you could use in a greenhouse or high tunnel, or if you're outside, follow general procedures on that. So those are just kind of putting the picture together. Let me just say, I was pleasantly surprised. Did you know that you guys have some hydroponic stores? Ever been to any of them? Well, this I just went and I went and Googled it. <laughs> if you went north and south, if you went north and south, you can also get Worms Way in there. So you've got some options here. The only problem I had is the majority of them are not OMRI, don't have OMRI approved materials. They have a lot of things that will, and you'll see in a minute, say organic. So now this is by one company, and it is actually OMRI approved. You can't see it, so I blew it up in there. Thrive Alive B1, and if it has the green label, it's OMRI approved. Thrive Alive B1, if it's red label, it's not OMRI approved. Hmm. You've got to be really careful and know what you're looking for. Try this one. So here's that one that was OMRI listed. Here's one, and if you look, and this is one you'll find in lots of those different hydroponic stores that were out there, a natural organic liquid fertilizer. Hmm, organic, is it OMRI approved? Trust me, I went and I searched the OMRI list. You can do it, it's really easy, and I linked to OMRI sites so you can do that. No, it's not. It also says, if you read really close, not for use with drippers, micro sprays, and hydroponics. Hmm. And this was from New Earth Garden Center. They actually had good information on their stuff, but you had to read the real fine print. Now, <clears throat> there are several out there, and I put some on the list in there. One that you may be familiar with, um, Daniels, which is now known as Nature's Source. Ball has bought them and has rebranded them. They actually have an organic plant food and it can be used through hydroponics as well as on the soil. It's a 311 on there. And on your resource sheet, not only do I give you a link to it, but I really like what Nature Source has done. They actually give you the list 
of how to do any kind of dilutions on it. So if you're looking to try and get parts per million nitrogen for <coughs> lettuce versus tomatoes, they actually tell you what to mix in a gallon to actually get it in there. Enviracure is a relatively new company. They do actually have one product and it's liquid and it has been used for hydroponics, not nearly as much as Daniel's and it's a 3.51, has some added mycorrhizae in there and um, I gave you the link where it's on but they don't have as much information on it but I know people are using it. It would definitely be really similar to use as the Daniel's, or sorry, Nature Source. There's a couple of others I found. Ocean the Solution 203. Technoflora has a couple of products and so does Grower Secret. The only problem I have with these is they don't have any way to mix them or to know how to dilute them for use for any kind of crop other than the one that has essential oils and botanicals in there. And that's all they've got it listed for. So I was very frustrated trying to find something. I also went through research papers, and most of the ones that anybody's using that's doing hydroponic research for publications, they're buying stuff in from Spain that isn't really something we can easily find here because I went looking for it. There are going to be others, but they were harder to find out there. And I just was even trying to look what you might be able to find even from the local stores. And you might get bits and pieces. You might even get them to get them in. Nature's source, I know you can actually get through BFG, premium horticultural supply, et cetera. So it's something they actually do carry. And so some of the greenhouse um, supply places may carry it or greenhouse centers may even carry it. So there's nature's source in there. Um, if you're using it, let us, depending on, you can run it from 100 to 200 parts per million, and they actually show a tank mix. So if you want 100 parts per million nitrogen, you just mix 0.3 ounces of it per gallon in there, and scale as you need it on there. So nice, easy way to do it. They do recommend using this, they say within a couple of days in there. It's because it's Because it's biologically active, there are still microbes in there. You might actually see blooms of algae, microbes, et cetera, especially if any light gets in. So you just kind of need to be watching it. Um, it's kind of like dealing with the fish fertilizers in there, especially if you're inside a greenhouse and playing with it. It's not necessarily always fun when you're mixing on there. At least in my opinion, it wasn't. Um, for OMRI approved media substrates, you can actually get OMRI approved perlite and core from a number of companies. Either check your local shops or go to OMRI to find some companies to work with. But I found ones that I've bought perlite from and core from before on the list. For starting seeds, if you want to use anything that's kind of akin to the rock wool, there are some different companies that actually make it, and Fafford actually has a germination media in there that actually is OMRI approved. Jiffy has a germination media, and Burpee even makes OMRI approved fiber pots, who knew? And then they've got these coconut, cocoa substrate propagation cubes, and so are Vandernaps in there as well. So there are some alternatives out there for that. I'm not going to go in because it would be a whole nother talk on talking about insect and disease control, that you basically need to look at whether you're growing it inside or outside and following appropriate procedures for organic production. It's nothing different in there with it. So my recommendations to you. I, to be honest, really love working on the hydroponics in there. And for us in West Virginia, it's going to be something I'm going to see some of our growers doing. We have some doing it already because our soil is so poor. It's not something we really can amend, and there's no really good places to buy good soil. So either going to raised beds with a soilless media or going to hydroponics for a lot of my farmers is really their best bet. Um, I would tell you start start small if you've never done it. It's fun. 
failing with something like that, which has minimal input, and having a couple of those, or in the Kratky method in there that Sid's got, do that. Try it out. It's not going to hurt you. Do some experimenting. Do your homework. Visit stores, operations, run the enterprise budgets. See, Sid, I have learned from you, <laughs> economists. If you're really doing this to be in the business, really run the production cost numbers in there and figure out if this really is going to be worth it or not. It's going to cost you more to go organic. Yes, you might get an organic price point. Is it worth it? Is it enough? Check with Kentucky Department of Agriculture. Talk with them. They probably know people in there. And I tell you to go out and find growers that are doing it, whether they're in this state or not in there. Um, I don't know that Crop King is doing much, but they're just in Ohio. And that'd be one that's a large hydroponic operation company in there. Um, at least to go and talk with them and see what they've got. They'll probably charge you. I'll just be honest in there. But see if there's hydroponic growers. We have a hydroponic grower that's less than an hour from us in Charleston that is currently still the largest hydroponic grower in the state. And they grow the majority of greenhouse tomatoes for not only Charleston, but not, they don't come as far over as here, but they go up into the Ohio area so and go down into Virginia. So they do it, but they're not doing it organic, and they have no interest in moving that. But if you want to see somebody, we could get you set up with them. And the other big one is keep records. There's no better way to figure out what worked and what didn't work than to keep records. Visual ones, like you guys have been doing, is great. So you can actually see what's worked and what hasn't worked and when something maybe started to go wrong in there. Firm believer in that. So, and this, this actually is one of my former students. This is basil. We harvested basil once a week, and this is the large leaf basil that the chefs really like in there. We harvested, I had it figured out, we harvested each tower had 32 plants. We harvested, I think it was 17 pounds a month off of one of those towers. And that was in the middle of winter. My students got really excited when they went and said, wow, if we did this all hydroponic and we did this all organic, and they figured out that every pound was like $22 in there, and they started going, we could just grow all of this in the greenhouse. And I said, that's really great. Who's going to buy that much basil? Mm -hmm. Not just in one week, but repeatedly. And so that is a continuing issue is where are you going to sell it? Make sure you've got those markets for it and that they're willing to pay the price so that you can actually make it, make some money on there. 